with demand expected to come back. The question remains, does this mean the economy is back on track? Companies now, after experimenting with offshore in places like India, Philippines, and Poland, want to bring those jobs back. We invest in the U.S. We're the biggest exporter in the country. In the cycle and right now, we're creating jobs. From Radio America, it's Neil Asbury's Made in America, the show that explores American industry, large and small, and promotes American-made products everywhere. Put Neil Asbury's Made in America to work for you. A very big welcome to you today. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, I'm looking at a headline here in the Detroit News sent over by our very, very competent producer, Phil. And the headline, and this is Detroit Noise, the headline is UAW President Rory Gamble under federal investigation. Yep. Is that is that a surprise? But listen to this. I mean, it's it's, it's really quite incredible. You know, he's, he's under investigation, federal investigation for taking bribes. So apparently him and some of his cahoots, some very senior ex- um, union uh, very high officials, as well as union vendors, um, it, 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 these bags of cash was being delivered to a strip club. And oh, given, I got confused given, for a second. Get, get this. I thought it was the Obama administration delivering it to Iran, but they don't have strip clubs. So, <laughs> all right, never mind. I just went down the wrong road for a second. But it had, and, 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 and it was for union-branded merchandise. So I guess there was a vendor who was supplying some union-branded merchandise, and, and bags of cash would show up at strip clubs where um, Mr. Gamble was, and I guess some of the other senior UAW people. So pretty amazing, but maybe it isn't amazing. But I guess that's the kind of way you imagine it, right? Bags of cash in strip clubs going to union officials. I mean, is that is that the uh, is, is well, of course it is. I mean, we've all seen Goodfellows, for God's sake. This, this whole thing reminds expect. me of Goodfellows. They're sitting at a bar. You're going to pan down the bar on your Chapman and you're going to take shots of all the people there. There's, you know, Tony two time, Tony two time. You know, I'm going to go see about that guy, about that guy. <laughs> I mean, he said everything twice. You're going to have I mean, everyone that you would have in Goodfellows is there. So De Niro is going to be, yeah, it's exactly what it's like, to be perfectly honest. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. But I'm not shocked. Are you, you're not shocked. We're all, we're all not shocked. No. But just the way it happened, you know. It was, yeah. It's not, they, they don't seem to have made the, 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 the money bags any, any uh, you know, less sophisticated. It's still the same thing. Brown paper bags filled with cash yeah. at strip clubs yeah. going to union officials. Yeah. Now, I have to say this. The UAW president, what's his name? Rory his Gamble. name is Rory Gamble. I don't want to say anything, but do you want to elect the president in the <laughs> UAW whose last name is Gamble? Does that say anything? I mean, come on. That's setting you up for sure. I don't know, Neil. Crazy world. Yes, it is. But hey, look, you know, Iran is in the uh, news this week in a very, mm. very big way. And, you know, with all the positive impact of America becoming energy sufficient. Imagine that. You know, if this whole thing had blew up in Iran, you know, you know, the, you know the years ago, and you don't have to go back that much time. I mean, even during the Obama administration, it, I, I can't imagine what the price of crude would be right now, and therefore the price of everything that derives from crude, including our gasoline and so many other products that we enjoy. But, but energy prices seem to be quite stable. So we're very pleased, Rich, to bring on Patrick DeHaan from GasBuddy.com to talk about energy prices in the U.S. and what we might expect. Patrick, welcome to Made in America. Thank you for having me. So, big event in Iran. It's been kind of going on for a while, but it's certainly been ratcheted up. And, you know, is, you know, is... Has 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 the Iranians backed down? Is you know are, is the U.S. you know comfortable with you know what their response is, and there won't be any further escalation? I don't know. Who knows? But what do we know about energy prices up until this point? At least this point, they seem to be fairly stable, and it hasn't been something that you know that you know all of a sudden there's all this uh, huge amount of speculation going on and driving up the cost of um, of crude oil, and that's a good thing for the American consumer, good thing for the American worker. But Patrick, will this hold? 
Well, you know what, for now, um, I think it will hold. Uh, looking at just about all of these issues, these complexities in regards to the Iran situation, well, as you point out, there was some initial, initial volatility in the price of oil, but all things considered, uh, you know, one could make an argument that uh, the volatility has been reduced significantly in light of the fact that the U.S. is now uh, the world's largest oil producer. Uh, so there's less risk from the Middle East. Of course, Iran does represent risk. They did go after Saudi Arabia last September. So that's where part of the, the risk assessment comes in, and that's why oil prices do react. But in the long run, so long as the situation continues to quiet down, which it appears to be doing for now, motors really have little to worry about. Well, yeah, it just seems like we're in a different environment right now. I mean, think about this. Over the year, we've seen things happen like oil tankers being taken over. You just mentioned that Saudi Arabia a facility was bombed and put out of commission. And uh, and uh, we had hostages taken in the Strait of Hormuz about two, two and a half, three, well, actually about three and a half years ago. And if you think about this, if if this was 10, 15 years ago, Oh, my God, we'd be paying, you know, $7 a gallon of gasoline. There's no question. Everybody would panic. The world's coming to an end. The cartel would take advantage of this. You know, prices of oil would go to $80, $90, $100 a barrel. But the truth of the matter is a lot of that has become irrelevant. And it really doesn't happen that way anymore. And probably, and as we're all discussing right now, is that we become a net exporter of energy and we supplant and take over and we don't really, I mean, maybe Patrick, tell me if I'm right. I don't think we need the Mideast anymore, at least from our point of view. Maybe not European point of view. But couldn't we, if in fact the, the Mideast and oil went on hold for a while, couldn't the U.S. fill in a lot of that and kind of stabilize the world? Well, I think that could be possible. You'd have to have a lot of things happening at the same time. You would have to forbid oil companies from exporting products so those products would stay here since we're not receiving any crude oil, we would not be able to export additional products. So that would you'd have to clamp on, down on that immediately to make sure the oil we do have is staying here because, you know, we are net energy independent, but we still do import six to seven million barrels of crude oil per day. But there's an argument that a lot of that ends up leaving the country as we export a total of eight million barrels of oil and refined products per day. So, um you know, with, you know, that's that's an amazing an amazing statistic, but but the fact is is that Iran isn't exporting its oil anyway, right? So yeah. unless they impact the exports of their next door next door neighbors, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, um, mm-hmm. they really they, they, Iran isn't supplying oil. How much oil are they exporting? Who do they export it to? Because they're not exporting it to us. Well, no, that's right. Uh, essentially, anything they're exporting right now is, is essentially in the black market since U.S. US sanctions uh, have stung them and uh, forbid most of our allies from buying from Iran. Uh, you know, you can't discount the are fact the Europeans that and Chinese, are, are, they, are they buying from exactly. Iran? Exactly. You know, the, the Chinese have, have gone around that and, and simply navigated around that. So, and, and keep in mind, it's not necessarily Iran's reduced capacity to produce oil, uh, since their oil can't really find a home, but uh, at least from this scenario where oil prices went up, the concern is, is more on Iran attacking its neighbor and putting into risk that Saudi production. That's right. It's all about the Saudi connection here and having the Saudi uh, oil, because if the United States in Saudi Arabia are open for business, Rich. I don't think that uh, Iran matter. Uh, Iran matters that much. That that's that's the point right there. Iran has made, been made irrelevant to a degree, except for the exporting of terrorism. They're still prime for that. So, um, Patrick, how about Venezuela? Where does Venezuela play into all of this? Because that oil has been taken off the market as well. So not only have we got Iran not producing and selling, or or you know, at least not on the open market, they have to do it on the black market. Venezuela is kind of in the same situation, right? To, to a degree. Uh, we haven't sanctioned Venezuela, but through the tremendous amount of corruption in Venezuela, through the fact that over the last five to ten years, socialism has led to very little investment in that infrastructure, which has now fallen apart. They've seen a tremendous kind of natural decline in production, 
that uh, has not been spawned by U.S. sanctions, but spawned by the fact that they were essentially raiding uh, the coffers of oil companies and taking that oil, oil production money and not reinvesting it in an infrastructure. But it was it was you know extreme corruption. So Venezuela has fallen, but in a completely different way in terms of production numbers. They they could see a rebound. Who knows if. If uh, if Maduro uh, essentially is forced from power someday, uh, and Venezuela sinks some money back into their assets, they could once again be a major exporter. Uh, and there's no U.S. sanctions that lie in their path like they do with Iraq. Hey, there's still a lot more to talk about uh, with energy and and where we're going with this. So many jobs are depending on it. We all depend on it. All our businesses, even if you're not in the energy industry, we all depend on energy to run our businesses. A very important topic. We're talking with Patrick Dehan from GasBuddy.com. Still a lot more to talk about with Dr. Rothman, myself, and Patrick. Stick with us. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. And we are together with Patrick Dehan from GasBuddy.com. Hey, so Patrick, to follow up on the, the Venezuelan thing, you know, how much how much foreign currency are they earning from their from their oil exports today? And is is that the reason why Maduro can still hold on? Is it is it that oil income that's got him holding on by a thread? And <laughs> Finally, is it in our interest to let him have that income? Is there anything we can do about it to shut it off? Because the situation in Venezuela is very dire, very, very dire. There are a lot of good people there who are suffering. We This, this issue has got to get resolved. Yeah, that's right. And, and so far, Maduro, if he is receiving any income, well, first of all, Venezuela uh, is, is likely indebted to China for some time. So China has a bunch of IOUs that – They've been cashing in on, on oil, and that's why Venezuela has very little funding to put into their infrastructures because the money that they borrowed from China, they spent, and now they they owe China uh, oil, and, and there's really no way that they can invest anything in there. But be that as it may, Maduro may be getting some uh, revenue, maybe a trickle, uh, but he can't really use U.S. dollars. He's sanctioned, and so are many Venezuelan heads. So. If uh, if there is any country that's somehow buying what little oil is coming out of Venezuela, and we would call it maybe tens of thousands of barrels per day at this point, or, or if they're lucky, maybe 100,000 barrels, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of legwork to avoid U.S. sanctions on heads of state. And, of course, uh, oil is generally priced in U.S. dollars, so th- there's a difficulty of, of whether or not they use dollars because if Maduro has dollars, uh, keep in mind, the U.S. has seized many of his assets, so there's there's difficulty in using U.S. dollars as well. But all in all, it's tremendously difficult right now for Venezuela uh, to get any revenue. Like I said, most of the oil they're producing is going right to China to cover those IOUs. Well, okay, so China China's taking their money. We can't. We're not getting their oil anymore. And in, in in you know Venezuela for a while was one of the top uh, traders with the Miami market, port of Miami. That's all gone. Well, I mean, gone, just, gone, I mean, gone. the amount of business they did with the United States was incredible. Was just unbelievable. It was like an incredibly important market for American exporters all over the country. So, all right. Having said all of that, so the Iranian oil becomes irrelevant. Venezuelan oil is at best confusing, and 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 certainly being taken by the Chinese, as you just pointed out. So, what does that mean for American oil producers, energy producers? Does that that open up bigger markets, make us even more productive? Well, without a doubt, that has supported the price of oil, even as the U.S. has increased output over the last decade from 5.5 to 13 million barrels a day. It's, you know, if if there was Iranian and Venezuelan crude oil on the market, they'd have a they'd have a you know saturated market much more than they face today. So it's essentially paved the way for U.S. production uh, to go up, even as oil prices are supported. You know, traditionally, if you throw all this the seven and a half million barrels a day of of, mar- uh, of oil on the market. Uh, 10 years ago, you know, you depress the price. But that's been the door then for U.S. Uh, oil companies is that they've been able to sell those barrels, a massive increase, and uh, oil prices have not come down. So it, it's been very strong. That's why the U.S. oil industry is so strong, because 
Uh, certainly Venezuela has opened the door through through their economic collapse, and Iran sanctions certainly are giving them help as well. So you know what it seems like to me, Patrick? It seems like if, if I was out there and I'm a country and I need to get energy, energy is the lifeblood of a country, and, um, and I have a choice. Do I want to get it from the Mideast? Do I want to get it from somewhere in, in uh, Latin America, Venezuela being the discussion right now? Well, wait a minute. The United States is doing well. They're in the marketplace. And guess what? They're a much more stable market. So I know I can count on them because you can count on the USA. Maybe that that's also developing behaviorisms that may be hard to go back on. Yeah, that's certainly true. I mean, once you know, once an overseas refinery that would buy American crude oil has found a reliable source, um, you know, you, you wouldn't tend to deviate from that. It's a path that you've already made. As long as the price is attractive on the global market, which it's going to be, um, you know, you're making relationships with buyers. So, I mean, to your point, uh, once once the U.S. has solidified these partnerships, once, you know, somebody's still buying their oil, uh, things look good for the U.S. in the years so, ahead. Now, we'll have to see if Venezuela turns around, but things are good. So, Patrick, you know, you said that the U.S. is producing 13.5 million barrels a day. I believe that's that's what you said. Can the United States sustain that? I mean, is the is the reserves there for that to go on? And this, uh, we're not borrowing from the future, are we? I mean, do we have that sort of capacity to continue on? Well, yeah, in 13 million barrels. It was 5.5 that we produced a decade ago, a lot of numbers. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sustainable. Now, there is going to be a period of mergers, consolidations, acquisitions because it's, it's maturing and there's a lot of oil companies out there that took on a lot of debt years ago to to produce this oil and and so that is leading to a point where there have been some bankruptcies the price of oil uh has been you know 55 60 dollars that's for some of these companies that are inefficient that's still you know barely breaking even so you're seeing a lot of that but i think it is sustainable in the years ahead for many of these areas. Um, you know, now don't be surprised if world oil prices dictate more of this sustainability than the production numbers themselves. And of course, lower oil prices are going to slow the increase in production down. Hey, Patrick, uh, thanks for being on the show, man. You've, you've done incredible. I mean, this is a very, very important topic. Very fascinating to know how well we're doing here in the United States in mm-hmm. the energy industry. Yeah, one of the reasons our economy is doing so well. Patrick Dehan from GasBuddy.com. Patrick, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we're going to switch gears here a little bit, Rich. We're going to talk about an international trade. Yeah, but well, good- that's pretty close. I mean, that's not a total walk away segue. Well, yeah, I mean, in the, in the relationships and what's going on with trade agreements around the world, and there's so many different facets of that. We're very pleased to have coming on with us Lenny Feldman from Sandler, Travis, and Rosenberg, one of the trade experts in Miami. Miami being a very big city of exports. You don't want to miss it. Made in America. Sharply higher at the open, stocks continued to perform well over the course of the day Tuesday. And I think that bodes well here over the next couple of years for having bigger demands coming to this country. Now, more of Neil Asbury's Made in America. Very big welcome to you today. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. So, Rich, let's talk trade. A lot of issues going on with trade, specifically China, but that's not the only game in town. That's not the only game in town. I mean... You got Brexit. What's going to happen there? What's going to happen between the United States and the U.K.? What's going to happen between the United States and the European Union? And then there's the whole Asian situation. You know, I think that we've lost a lot of ground in Asia as we've withdrawn from the area. And we have. We have very, very much so from the days that I spent out there. uh, Southeast Asia was America's backyard when it came to trade. China now has stepped in and, and, and filled that void because we've stepped back from a very important trade agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Was that the right move or not the right move? What comes next? Well, we're very pleased to have on one of America's great trade and customs uh, uh, lawyers. He's, he's very, very successful, based in Miami. He's very much on top of trade issues and what it means for our country, what it means for our exporters. We're very pleased to have with us Lenny Feldman from Sandler, Travis, and Rosenberg. Lenny, welcome to Made in America. 
Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Neil and Rich. So, you know, as you... You know, as you as you think about trade right now and you see what's going on around the world and so many different things that has so much impact on our economy, on our jobs, on our earnings and, you know, how we are compensated, how we are paid. You know, what is what is the most important issue right now that you feel between America and our trade partners around the world? Great question. I think a lot of it is just trying to get our arms around what is our country's trade policy? Are we trade friendly? Are we protectionist at this point? Frankly, is it a combination of the two? You know, we had the NAFTA agreement, which I was, I'm was i proud to say I was a negotiator of the NAFTA agreement in the 1990s. We thought it was a good ag- agreement at that time. At least a lot of us did. But there were some concerns about what it would do to U.S. jobs. Glad to see that we're really almost at the finish line to see the USMCA, the NAFTA 2.0, renegotiated, which personally I felt was needing needing some major overhaul and updating. And uh, hopefully we're going to see that come through, and then at least we'll have certainty as to what the rules of the road will be in North America. The question then, of course, will become how will that be implemented, and as you were mentioning, what are we looking towards the end game with China, with steel, with aluminum globally, and now with the EU, that we're looking at trade tensions there? Just so many balls in the air right now, Neil. Well, you know, it, it seems like uh, you know, it's very interesting. When, when something happens in the Mideast, as it did this week, and we had all these concerns and uh, security concerns about Iran, and we're talking about energy, and the markets really didn't fluctuate. They went up a little bit, and then within days they went back down where they were, in fact, a little bit below that. But when it comes to trade, I find it intriguing, gentlemen, that when we when someone says something about trade with China, and we've seen this, Neil, it swings. You get a swing. All Kudlow has to do is come out and say, hey, we really are doing well, and, and, or someone says that. And then next thing you know, the market jumps up 75, 100, 200 points almost immediately. They are so responsive. You know, Lenny, it seems like the markets, the, the, the global markets, are more responsive when you talk about the word trade and tariffs and trade deals and negotiations than they are with, you know, taking out a terrorist and having the net exporter of terrorism of the world, you know, you know threaten us and threaten the rest of the world. That's not as important. It's trade, Lenny, I think, that really drives the whole thing. Absolutely. I mean, whereas trade might be in the, the, the last page of the D or E section of the paper, um, one need only look at, say, the Wall Street Journal, very interesting article that I have in front of me that was published yesterday. Uh, the CEO of Allegheny Technologies uh, runs a steel mill saying, hey, you know, we're all, we're all for readjusting our trade policy. Uh, we've reopened. But on the same token, I need an exemption. I need to make sure my inputs come in. These stories were backline stories, backroom stories. Now it's it's so prevalent in the news. Uh, any radio show such as this really getting a lot of attention. And as you mentioned, it, just whispering the word trade resonates. It's as though somebody is yelling now. Oh, what's that going to mean to the economy? What's it going to do to the markets? And it's it's really having an impact, and it's going to continue to have an impact in 2020 because there's still going to be a lot of twists and turns to it. So, Lenny, I'm going to get some free legal advice right now. Please, you know, see, I can do that. See, I'm a radio host, but I'm also an entrepreneur, and right. uh, you know, I own a number of businesses. We have over 200 patents and and trademarks. A lot of it is protected in China. Some of it is not. And China, I got to tell you, it's a sham. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on there, not just us, but the counterfeit products. You know, you know, my products being made in China, shipped to the United States, even with my packaging and photography. And that's going on. We're losing lots of business that way. And then in China itself and not being able to protect our intellectual property, even if you have the intellectual property, 
you know, the, the, the due process is so stacked against you, you know, you're not going to win, especially in this environment where America and China has this friction and Americans in China right now, I mean, they're just trying to give us a black eye anywhere they, they can, not even the government, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of nationalistic fervor in China, just like you would expect. They're very patriotic people. They think America is trying to beat them up. So they take it out on American companies and entrepreneurs like me. So what, what can we do? I mean, is there anything that's happening in phase one in this trade agreement that's going to make it more fair in, you know, for American entrepreneurs, small people? We don't have the money to fight the, 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 the Communist Party of China and the government in China. Our government's supposed to help us do that. They're supposed to be standing on our side. So is there anything in this agreement that's going to lessen my burden in trying to protect my intellectual property? That's what we're hoping to see. To tell you the truth, the devil's going to be in the details. What we, what I think is fascinating, Neil, about what we're seeing here is we're bringing China to the table because your complaints are the complaints of many good, compliant traders who are trying to do the right thing, uh, make some money, not only by going global, but also supporting jobs in the United States because we know that's what trade does, and that's our goal at the end of the day, to be quite frank. And as we start seeing this rollback, this peel back of the onion, so to speak, with this phase one of China, that is on the table, that there is uh, language, there is discussion as to how those IP protections are going to be granted. The question will be, is this tariff shift going to create a cultural shift? So for now, I think the jury's still out on it, uh, to, to use a, a famous legal uh, phrase or analogy there. But um, we're hopeful. It looks like China's listening because the tariffs, as you, as you read, I think, in most publications, are hurting them. A lot of the companies we work with are shifting. Some of them are actually finding, I could have the protections I need by going to other sources in other countries. Others are saying, well, maybe I need to stay in China, but now hopefully there will be those protections in place. But again, we have to wait and see what's going to come down to the, 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 the ink and paper as to what's going to be signed. But I think these next few months, we're going to see if they're really going to put their money to their mouth is. So I hey, think we're going to take a quick break. We're on with the... Going to be key. We're, uh, Lenny, we're going to take a quick break. We're in with Lenny Feldman. A lot more to talk about trade. Lenny's with Sandler Travis and Rosenberg, one of the most well-known trade lawyers in South Florida. You don't want to miss it. A lot more to talk about. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Ruffman. We're together with Lenny Feldman from Sandler, Travis, and Rosenberg. We're going to continue to talk about trade policy with one of America's most well-respected trade and commerce attorneys based in Miami. Rich, I know that you've been wanting to jump in on this conversation here. Um, where do you see where do you see America's biggest challenge right now well, in trade? Well, I, I, there are a couple of things, but I want to I want to get back to China for a second, and I think we have to get to the USMCA. I think that's important, uh, and, and and Lenny is very much on top of that as well. As a matter of fact, Sandler, Travis, and Rosenberg have a number of seminars coming on, on uh, relating to that. But what I find interesting, Lenny, is that uh, Tesla, you know, Tesla China, Tesla this, Tesla that, Tesla in space. Um, it seems like they have absolutely taken the naysayers of the of the stock market. Tesla's value, corporate value, is larger than Ford and General Motors right now. It this week it surpassed it. It's just unbelievable. But what's interesting, and and I'd like to hear Lenny's thoughts, they took Tesla for the number three car, the three car, the the smaller one that's coming out. They lost their tax breaks. They I think they expired in the United States, so they went to China. And he's building Tesla in China. In fact, the first cars came off the other day, and they're all excited running around and, you know, massive celebrations. Uh, everyone's getting a free picture of Mao but, uh, <laughs> or something like that. But um, so it's still interesting that large corporations are still seeking out, you know, protection in, for themselves in terms of pricing going back to China. What do you say, Lenny? 
we're still seeing it. China at trade and business is alive and well. Look, it's always going to be alive and well. It's still going to be growing, uh, generally speaking, especially once we peel back the trade war. The question also is going to be, well, what reassurances does Tesla have in China that its proprietary information, its patents, its trademarks, et cetera, will be protected. I would assume if, they've, if they're out there, they're comfortable, of course, with the price of the, what the labor costs out there, that they have assessed what their risks and rewards are, and they feel that they're in a safe haven. And I got to tell you, autos, that is an entity amongst itself. And as we get towards looking at the USMCA and how that agreement's changing for autos as well, there are a lot of folks in the auto industry, a lot of executives really looking globally now to see what makes sense. As long as they have those legal protections in place that someone else isn't going to come around and, and make the next Tesla, make a Chinese version of it and steal their information. That would be my issue. But if you settle that and you have those reassurances, yeah, the price is probably still right. So, uh, Lenny, uh, you know, I mean, the United States and in, in our largest our largest uh, trade partners, of course, is Canada and Mexico, right? I mean, they buy mm-hmm. more American products than China and Japan. In fact, sure. Mexico buys more products uh, American products than China and Japan. Uh, than China and Japan. I mean, that's how powerful this North American trading uh, block that we have with Mexico and Canada is. Though you know the population is so much less, we do so much more business with less people. Why? Is because we have access to those markets. We have right. access to Canada. We have access to Mexico under the same conditions that they have access to our market. We don't have access to Japan. We don't have access to China. You know, it's a one way street there. So, so Lenny, you know, talking about. Southeast Asia, and I lived there for many years. I'd like to hear your thoughts about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You know, Obama was very much against it, and then at the end of his his administration, he then supported it after, what, six years? Oh, we got to do Trans-Pacific Partnership. You know, that really linked Southeast Asia, East Asia to the United States. I think it was very, very important. Obama was going to go forward with it. Then he obviously, uh, you know, his legacy kind of ended there, you know, with Donald you think? Trump being, yeah, yeah, being elected. Yeah, hit a wall. And, and he went way, you know, Trump then says, okay, we're going to go, you know, we, this is a terrible thing. We're going to rip it up. And my, uh, my thought is that we've just left that whole very important marketplace to China and they are absolutely cleaning our clock. So can we get that back or in this environment we are today, you know, just trade agreements are going to be seen as bad and we're just never going to get back to being very aggressive, putting trade agreements together, you know, especially with groups of countries and just focus, you know, kind of one at a time. It's just going to we're going to be at a huge disadvantage, a huge disadvantage with Europe and the Chinese if we don't get back in this game. Yeah, Neil, look, I'm with you 100%. I was a big advocate, and I continue to be very bullish of the opportunities that could arise for the T- with the TPP. Um, I know that the administration is really focused on a bilateral approach, country-by-country country approach to FTAs. But look who we could have grown as part of that global market, that free trade market. And it really was it such a jump from where we are now. Chile was part of it. Already we have a free trade agreement with them. Singapore and Mexico, we know the story about Mexico. Peru and Australia and Canada, free trade agreements. So already the majority of the members we already are trading with and a free, with through free trade agreements bilaterally. So you add in Brunei, you add in Japan, which, by the way, we do have a trade agreement them, with them. It's nascent, and it's just being um, now implemented. So that's already on the horizon. And that leaves you New Zealand, Malaysia, and Vietnam. You know, we have and very Philipp- good relationships. And the Philippines, yeah. Right, which, by the right. way, I mean, that's and so. Indonesia, and Indonesia, which yeah. are very, very important markets for American products. I mean, it's... Uh, I, I just think it was a huge lost opportunity. And I'm an American manufacturer. You know, I, those are very important markets that we forfeited. I mean, we ruled in the 80s and 90s. I got to tell you, American products in Southeast Asia, that was the way to go. It was a great time to be an American exporter. And mm-hmm. since China entered and we pulled back, I got to tell you, it's tough to sell American products in that part of the world just because we're at a huge disadvantage. 
Yeah. Hey, Lenny, unfortunately, we're out of time. It's been a great, great conversation. So we're going to have to get him back. Yeah, like, yeah, you have yeah, to go yeah. over that USMCA. we got to do so much more. Know. And what's going to happen with the UK? Uh, what would a, a US-UK trade agreement look like? Phil will be in, in touch with you soon. we got to get you back on. Lenny Feldman from Sandler, Travis, and Rosenberg. Lenny, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure, guys. Have a great one. Coming up, Dr. Rothman and I have some final thoughts for the day. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host, Dr. Rich Ruffman. So Rich has a newsflash. Because of declining imports coming into the United States, the U.S. Department of Commerce, who tracks these things, has said that our trade deficit with the rest of the world is at a three-year low, and our deficit this year declined by 8.2%. It's quite amazing. So our deficit has decreased. You know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, does that mean, but have we, are we doing less business? So, you know, if you want to... Well, it's fewer that, imports and more exports for the time being right now. But that could be also a or, function of what's been going on with tariffs and so forth. Or the overall business is also down. I don't know. But, but it is a good statistic coming out of the U.S. Department of Commerce that the American trade deficit is down. And we're at a three-year low. So, anyway, I thought I'd throw that in. Because well, we just I think were talking you should. About yeah, no, no, no. I think that's very important. It's something that we've been looking at. And, and it's something that the Trump administration has been trying to work on to somehow, you know, resolve this incredible deficit. When you have a an $800 you know, billion dollar deficit, $500 billion, I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of jobs. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, Rich, you know, it's amazing that, you know, we're, we're here coming towards the end of our time today. But, you know, let's get an update on the impeachment process, right? We did that last week. You know, a lot going on. Uh, impeachment, you know, is that something that will disrupt the economy? Will it not disrupt the economy? Will Americans wake up one day and say, oh, my goodness, this is a major mess. I'm going to start selling my 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 uh, securities. The stock market is going to be greatly impacted. So many pension funds and so many American many Americans have their retirement funds in the stock market. Boy, wouldn't that be a disaster? But so far, uh, just like gas prices and in uh, crude prices, hasn't been impacted because of what's going on with Iran. It's holding very steady. It seems like the market is holding very steady with what's going on with our trade relationships Mm -hmm. and what's going on with the impeachment process. Americans just seem to be tuned out. They're not interested. Well, I mean, that's the whole point. And, and the market already factored that in a long time ago and said, this is, this is a, a nothing burger because there's nothing there. there was, there's, again, like, but you were clear about this. There is no direct hard evidence of any crime, misdemeanor, high crime or misdemeanor that's been um, uh, sponsored by the president of the United States. It just doesn't exist right now. And, and the fact that you know Pelosi, who seems to be trying to control the Senate as well as the House, and she's saying, well, we got to watch out for the Constitution, except she doesn't understand the Constitution clearly says she has nothing to do with the Senate. And Mitch McConnell is making it very clear to her, I will not be you know, verbally beaten over this. This is where we are. This is what the Constitution says. The, the truth of the matter is America doesn't care. They don't care. 67% of the country doesn't care right now. Rasmus is saying the numbers are going directly against the Democrats and for the Republicans because they're seeing what a sham the whole thing is. Look, it was so important. That Pelosi and, and Schumer and you know um, uh, pencil neck Schiff is got to get we got to you know we've got to impeach him. We have to save the next election for make America safe for democracy. This president is doing horrible things to make it unconstitutional of the United States in the next election. And then of course she gets us through because she basically controlled it with an iron hand on a strictly you know it's not it's not bipartisan. The only thing that was bipartisan was they voted not to do it. That was bipartisan. That's the Democrats and they had Republicans do that. But the truth of the matter is she does that. She gets the votes, of course, on partisan lines. And then she absolutely refuses to send the documents over to the Senate. Doesn't exist. Sitting there. 
And she's saying, well, soon. One of these days. I think I'm, don't tell me I know. I know what I'm doing. I don't think she knows. I think she is in such a corner right now that she got backed into by the far crazies that she doesn't know what to do with this. Because if there is a true trial and you do get witnesses, which McConnell doesn't really want to do, but if you did that, the truth of this whole thing is going to come out, and that's not going to inure benefit to the Democrats. I think that you're right. <laughs> I, think I think I am, too. Right. You convinced me. So another th- fascinating, we just got a very, very few uh, moments left, is is how Bernie Sanders continues to rise in the polls. You know, there's a real shot at him becoming the Democrat nominee. Isn't that and, amazing? And the fascinating thing is, is the Democrat elite are just totally, I, they're totally shocked. They're beside themselves. I, they don't know what to do about that. The media doesn't know what to do about that because they don't want Bernie. They don't want Bernie. Bernie's really fighting. You know, he's fighting, you know, conservatives, conservatives and Republicans like you would expect. But he's also fighting the Democrats. Well, you know what? He better take it easy because he'll give himself a heart attack. Oh, wait a minute. (laughs) Just saying. Well, Rich, (laughs) that's going to be the last note of today. Yep. But we're going to be back again next week. And this is like so much fun. You don't want to miss it. But be with us next week at the same time for another adventure of Made in America, where we never stop fighting for your jobs. 